Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Boxcore Geek Show. You, I am your host this week, I guess. I'm your host, Patrick Mitten, also known as the NBA Geek. You can find me on Twitter at NBA Geek. I am here with Nerd Numbers, who's also known as Andres Alvarez, and you can find him on Twitter under the handle at Nerd Numbers. Say hello, Andre. Uh, hey, and I'm going to consider this a uh, Norm Nixon, Magic Johnson thing. So I was the point guard. I'm not going to be like Norm <laughs> Nixon. I don't want to be traded to the Clippers. So I'm deferring to Magic Johnson. I'm just happy to be on the team. <laughs> we're doing kind of a weird thing. Before I end I'll introduce Brian in a second. But we're doing kind of a weird thing where the guy with the deep radio voice is actually not going to be the host. He's actually going to be the color commentator. And instead, you're going to get me, the guy with the high sort of nasally voice, to be your play-by-play -play guy and host. And we're going to see how that works out for us. I think... I think Dre likes it this way because then I have freedom to swear more. Uh, that's just my theory of why you like having me on the host. I'm not really sure I, what I the like deal that. is. And, and, and one thing I'll notice is you move the show along well. So like I may have the radio voice, but I definitely, and it's happening right now, I definitely get like caught in the trenches. You move the show along great. So like I much prefer that. And so I, I'm, you know, with the show going the way it is, I'm hoping we keep that up. Okay. Well, in the spirit of moving things along, let me also introduce you to the voice of God. Wait voice are you visible brian yeah i am on camera again this week so this is again i am i gotta rehearse my shit better brian's on camera he is normally the voice of god but today he's also the face of it he's our lovely producer you can find him at box score box score brian on Twitter. you got it you got he's it brian foster he'll be responsible for making us look good giving you the data and the stats and the other cool pictures and things while we're talking usually Actually, usually Dre and I are completely oblivious to what Brian's doing, and then later when we see the show, we're like, "Oh wow, that's really cool! He brought that in there." And like, I'm always kind of amazed at how when I, whenever I occasionally watch the show, I don't really like to watch the show because I kind of hate hearing the sound of my own voice. <laughs> but uh, when I do watch the show, I'm always kind of amazed at the clever graphics and things that Brian brings in. So anyway, just a little plug about how awesome Brian is. Um, well, thanks a lot. Yeah, go for it, Patrick. Keep so, going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move it along. I'm going to move it along. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, several things. We're going to talk a little bit about Chuck because Chuck's always in the news. We're going to revisit the Dan uh, – the, the, uh, no, I almost said Dan Nolan. The Dan Gilbert versus James Dolan debate in as much as there is one. Uh, we're going to talk about Kevin Durant. We're going to talk about – we might mention the All-Star game. We're going to wrap up some shout-outs and feedback from everybody. Um but first, I'd like to circle into what we're going to introduce as a, a new segment. We're going to do this new segment on Box Score Geeks, and we're going to call this new segment "What the Fuck Just Happened." So, um, usually, I think we're going to use this as like a platform for both of us in alternating capacity to sort of look at what happened in the last week and and call out a particular thing that we thought was kind of crazy and over the top. Um, and this week, I think there's two big topics there. Well, there's two topics that are going to bo ask both of us to, you know, sorry, I'm not phrasing as well at all, but both of us basically saw some things happen and both of us looked at the news and said, what the fuck just happened? Um, in Dre's case, it was Kevin Durant at the All-Star Game. So why don't you talk a little bit about what the fuck happened with Kevin Durant? And I, I'm, I'm happy that, or I guess sad that you're not as excited as I was about the All-Star break. And I think maybe I'm just <laughs> so... Sad the about the lack of man. NBA news. Yeah, I, I get that, you know, as, a, as an NBA junkie, you kind of want things to always be happening. And so when the NBA All-Star break is on, it's like nothing important is really happening. And you can see, you can see the, you know, the guys on TV struggling to make it relevant. Like Kenny Smith just struggling to make his color commentary during the three-point shootout matter, you know, uh, but nothing anyone says it does or says during the All-Star Week matters in terms of, you know, wins and losses and other things that we actually care about. I guess it's a good gossip time. Uh, and, and actually, we got to find a way to fit Carmelo Anthony into this whole rant as well if we're going to talk about gossip. But um, but anyway, Kevin Durant made us kind of go, what the fuck? So why don't you talk a little it's, bit about that? Basically, Kevin Durant, maybe he was just inspired by Marshawn Lynch 
put on his Marshawn Lynch hat during the All-Star break festivities in the pregame show. During a press conference, he basically said, look, I'm just here because I'm because I have to be right, because all the all the athletes in their contract have something that says, you know, you have to talk to the media. Uh, he says, I don't really care what you think about me. Um, you know, you're just going to write whatever you want to write. And I don't really care. And, you know, some people, if, if like it always comes up where I compare this to the WWE, and I'm going to do that again with Chuck uh, Charles. Oh, yeah. OK, this is a great because I was going to ask you as part of this is what Kevin Durant's doing right now. Is this a heel turn? Is and, Kevin and, Durant doing a heel turn? Uh, yeah. And what's his name? I think it's Julian Rogers. I, I believe it's uh, ASFW underscore Roger. I'll, I'll get the Reality I'll get the handle correct in the show select. note write up. So I, I don't want to get that wrong. But he said that he said James Harden pulled a uh, face turn and Kevin Durant pulled a heel turn this all star break. Yeah. And it, what's interesting, I love the heel turn parable. I, I haven't watched any professional wrestling since I was 18, which is a really long time ago. But uh, what's interesting about heel turns is that, you know, fans always kind of see them coming, you know, it doesn't, or it usually doesn't just happen in one episode of Monday Night Raw or whatever. There's usually hints and buildups where a he, or, you know, a guy who was previously a, a nice guy starts doing things that are kind of eh and iffy. And in the case of Kevin Durant, I think we saw lots of him just kind of being mean uh, on the court. And, you know, there was the episode where he called uh, Dwight Howard a pussy, I guess. And then, the, and then there was a couple of, there were a couple of games where, uh, you know, he he, you know, justifiably was kind of trash talking about how awesome he is because uh, he was destroying some team. Whereas I think uh, most did of I go out, Brian, or did Patrick go out? No, we are OK. Uh, keep going, Patrick. And uh, Joe, you're fine, too. <laughs> uh, Get right back so into it, Patrick. The voice of God a... interrupting me. <laughs> so, I mean, it, there were signs, right, that it was going to happen. And I, I obviously don't think the NBA is scripted like the WWE is, but I think it's a great parallel because all of a sudden Kevin Durant doesn't quite have the same sort of shiny good guy image he used to have. Yeah, that, I mean I – mean, that, that's absolutely true. And one thing I wish the NBA would do, and in fact, I wish professional wrestling would remember, because this is what professional wrestling used to really get the idea of selling the narrative. And sports can be really boring without behind the scenes narrative. And I wish the NBA would actually embrace some of the villains and heroes and stuff they can have. You know, when the NBA was at its peak with like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and then later Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley, they embraced these like caricatures almost that you know every week you'd get into fights you know charles barkley's not a role model the villain against michael jordan the perfect you know the, the poster the bad boy. boys their whole team was like they, they sold the whole idea that the pistons were all not very nice people exactly you know? like people actually actively hated the pistons unless you were in detroit <laughs> in that case you loved the pistons right Exactly. And so I love embracing that. Uh, I want to take I want to take a slight veer off and go to uh, the ESPN watch Jonathan Weiler territory here because mm -hmm. he kind of mentioned this about Marshawn Lynch. You didn't want to talk too much about it, but there is one interesting thing about basically um, people of color, professional athletes and how they're expected to behave. So that is one of the weird points you get into in terms of talking to the media, which is we really get upset at basically black athletes not being nice to the media. And we don't really care as much about white athletes. Now in Kevin Durant's case, this felt way too timed. It's the all-star break, right? Nothing's happening. He's doing it when the, the spotlight's on other people. You know, he, he's got a contract coming up in a few years. This felt more like his PR person said, we need to, you know, the, the pretty boy image isn't working for you, especially because LeBron James is kicking your butt. He's winning the titles. Everybody loves him. He's Teflon. Now that he's gone back to Cleveland, do something with your image so we can sponsor you better. That's what it felt like. But, I don't you know, know I, about I, that because, I mean, Kevin Durant is swimming in sponsorships. He just signed a $250 million shoe deal. That's, I mean, $250 million shoe deal over 10 years. He's making more on shoes, and that's just shoes. It's not like Gatorade or all of his other deals. He's making more on that than he is as a basketball player for the Thunder. So I'm not really sure I buy that this is like a power play to improve his marketability. And in fact, I find it interesting that he, Kevin Durant is in extremely marketable in contrast to Marshawn Lynch, who really only, as far as I can tell, does Skittles and like a few local Seattle like 
plug for the local plumber. I think he does like, you know, stop freaking call Beacon, the local plumber ads here in Seattle. I can't really think of anything else Marshawn Lynch really does. Uh, he's just not very marketable. And, and, and Marshawn Lynch reminds me very much of, at least I wasn't alive then, but the portrayal of guys like Roger Maris, who just apparently had no idea how to make themselves sort of affable and personable in front of the media. And Marshawn Lynch is a lot like that. Like, he seems affable and personable when you get him with Conan O'Brien and playing video games, but you get him in any sort of interview setting, he just doesn't know how to be sort of, you know, he doesn't, you contrast it to how Richard Sherman is, he just doesn't know how to let the cliches flow when the cliches need to flow and kind of be, you know, only be real in certain like moments. And whenever he tries to sort of be genuine, it just comes across the wrong way. And then the media portrays him uh, in a in at least the, he thinks the media portrays him poorly. Um, but Kevin Durant's never seemed to have that problem. You know, Kevin yeah, Durant I, just goes out and he trots out the cliches and, you know, just doing it for the team and one day at a time and blah, 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 blah. Right. He's definitely got that like Russell Wilson, like I could just talk to the media and just say nothing and be fine. Uh, where and his play is electrifying and he kind of lets that speak for itself. So this all just seems weird to me. I just don't know. So, like so you don't you don't you don't think this is planned at all? You think just Durant just got upset over all the all star break and just decided to go off on the media? I you know, there was a thing like a few weeks ago on social media when Nick Collison's contract was extended and Chris Palmer was like I think it was Chris Palmer, right? Was it Chris Palmer? I think was it was this Chris the guy Palmer. that 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 got like Durant said like you got fired was he the one who got fired or something and said like you don't so know yeah him? Chris Palmer I think it was Chris Palmer and I'm sure Brian right now is googling as we speak right uh, but he, he basically says you know no wonder they never win a title because that's a terrible contract and Kevin Durant fires back you know this coming from the guy who got fired for being an idiot. Um, you know, regardless of whether that's true, clearly Kevin Durant was pissed off at somebody from the media. And I I could I I feel like, you know, this has been a rough season for Kevin Durant. He's not lost in a long time. And I can totally see that maybe he's just kind of pissed off and he's um sort of venting a little bit. I mean, huh. I don't think there's I don't think there's a serious like like I think he'll just recover and sort of go back to normal eventually, but um I can see him just kind of being like in this frame of mind where he thinks everybody in the media is a slime bag or whatever like that. Right. And I, yeah, by the way, well, by the, I by agree with way. Durant's sentiment that Nick Collison was an, was an awesome contract extension. I mean, I think you and I agree here. He's always been an underrated star player, so to speak. Um, and I completely agree that with Kevin Durant, that Chris Palmer has no fucking idea what he's talking about from a basketball perspective. But we also agree that that's, if you're like a prominent athlete, like I can sit here and say Chris Palmer is a fucking moron because nobody cares what I say. And there's like 10,000 people who are going to watch this show like ever in the history of the Internet. But Kevin Durant can't say that because he's like this public figure with an image trying to like, you know, be marketable. And I bet he got a lot of like flack for that tweet, even though he was in the right from his agents, from fans, from other people, you know. Patrick, I've got this series of tweets up on screen right now, and I'll read them out for the audio-only folks. Uh, Chris Palmer's <laughs> reply was, dude who averages three points and three rebounds gets two-year, eight million extension. No wonder they won't make the playoffs. And Kevin Durant's reply was, means a lot coming from a dude who got fired for being a dumbass. Yeah, so I agree that's a dumbass comment, because seriously, you're going to point you're going to point at points per game and rebounds per game for a guy who plays what 15 minutes a game. And you, you like, how the fuck did you get your job as a basketball analyst? Uh, I could totally agree with, uh, with Kevin Durant there. And, and I, I would have to say like 90% of the tweets, Chris Palmer sends out that have any, that make some sort of attempt to evaluate basketball. I'm like, dude, how did you get your job? So but, so actually, by the way, I, I hate this because I, I mentioned I'm putting you in the point guard role and I want to steal this because this <laughs> this was actually – I started venting about this. Um, so when we talk athletes not getting how to market themselves, and this is what's weird about Kevin Durant is you're saying this totally feels like a shoot – or not a shoot, a promo in wrestling, but it seems kind of misplaced because I'm like, seems planned. You're like, well, no, it doesn't. And I'm actually – 
I've swung to your side. I agree. But yeah, if, if it was planned, it's not planned very well because everybody's just kind of. I mean, there's a reason this whole entire episode is on our segment called "What the fuck just happened?" Because everybody's kind of reacting to it like, "Dude, what the fuck? Everybody loves you. What are you so pissed off about?" It doesn't but, make but any on, sense. Yeah, but on that note, when it comes to like people who kind of get the gamesmanship and showmanship of sports media. Charles Barkley made the news last week. I'm the, the same. You were saying the what the whoa, fuck whoa, just whoa. happened. You're segueing to Charles Barkley? I thought I was the I, host. I, so that's what I was <laughs> I said I stole because I, this seemed perfect because you just talked about Chris Palmer. or Was, was that his name? Palmer? What's his first name? Palmer. Chris, Chris Palmer. Okay, cool. Um, he was taught, you were talking about him being unable to evaluate. And so what, what bugged me in kind of the similar vein is with Charles Barkley, which, you know, if it's okay to transition, I'm okay if we want to stand Kevin Yeah, Durant. you just take over the, you know, okay. sometimes the shooting guard handles the ball, so go for it. Exactly. Okay. So I mentioned Charles Barkley basically came out and he, this, this, see, this seemed much more planned because he said, analytics are dumb. Uh, he took a shot at Daryl Morey. This how it kind of started because Daryl Morey said, I'm glad I don't have to listen to Charles Barkley. And Charles Barkley said, Daryl Morey's an idiot. Analytics are stupid. Guys that use analytics just do it because they couldn't make the team. Um, one slight segue there. <laughs> one of my favorite players on Philadelphia before Charles Barkley was Dr. J, who in his book talks very many analytical things. So anyway. Yeah. Oh, you read, um, if you read Dr. J's book, it's like he just talks about efficiency and like points per procession. And like he, he clearly – uh, and I don't, I don't know. I don't think Dr. J is a stat head, but he clearly agrees with all the concepts that, you know, us stat heads keep pushing and saying are really important. And another great part about the same book is in that book, he actually he, he was a, a sideline commentator for a while. And he said, you just have to talk so much meaningless, stupid stuff to fill the time. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even, <laughs> even you and I, if we're watching a basketball game and there's a break, what do you do? Right. You, we, you last week, I think you mentioned like. You know, even the inventor of adjusted plus minus is like, this is meaningless without at least a season of data. So if you've got a quarter of data and, you know, Russell Westbrook's one for four, what it, you've got to talk about Russell Westbrook's one for four for two minutes to pass the time. Well, you know, they're shilling. Yeah. Kevin you know, oh, this every time, saying? every time this reminds me of everyone's favorite interview with Greg Popovich, where, you know, the, 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 the person asking the questions after, I think it was after the half or after the third quarter, um, you know, there's a sideline reporter asking Chris Popovich, and he's like, well, you know, Mono Ginobili was really struggling in the first half. He couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. Like, how did you know to stick with him? And Popovich kind of looking at him, he's like, well, he's, he's Mono Ginobili. And, <laughs> and so the guy follows up again, and he's like, asks, he's following up that question with another inning question where he's like, yeah, but, you know, Ginobili shot like, you know, one of eight from, from three. And like, how did you know that he was going to make that kind of a turnaround? Pop's like, rolling his eyes. He's like, cause he's Mano Ginobili. And you know, it, Pop doesn't have the patience to sit there and explain, like, I'm not going to make a substitution on Mano Ginobili because of, you know, 10 bad minutes when I've been watching the guy play for four years and he's fucking amazing. Like, I know that the amazing is going to come back because that's what happens in basketball. And he doesn't have the patience to say that. And he has no patience for these sideline interviews anyway. And he thinks the question's stupid. So he's saying, well, that's that's because he's Manu Ginobili. And it's, I mean, we talk about this all the time. It's like, you know, we you cannot evaluate a player based on, so, so actually there's two different concepts at war here. One is that a lot of the things that we care about that we know do impact wins are, highly variable a player can shoot seven of ten from the field one night and four of ten the next night and overall total he looks pretty good because he's shooting 11 of 20 but there's a huge amount of variance in there but that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that we're saying yeah when you shoot from seven of ten that has a high impact on winning and when you have a shoot on four of ten that's bad for your team and your team's more likely to lose those those Factors don't change. Those correlations don't change. But when it gets even worse, when you talk about plus minus numbers that literally mean nothing. So a guy could shoot seven of 10 and have eight. To, to clarify in the first for half. anybody, for anybody who's going to like hop in and try, like I always get mad at corner case. People are like, except I'm like, yeah, good job. Congratulations. Plus minus means something at the team level. You cannot trace it back to the individual in any meaningful manner. That is not just like 90% noise. Yeah, it's 90% noise and what you end up, even when you know, the guys who say, well, after like three or four years, uh, 
they, they say it all starts to coalesce and starts to mean something. And, and I'm like, no, it doesn't. What it starts to coalesce and mean is whether or not you played on a winning team. And sure, if you're LeBron James, it's more likely you've played on winning teams your entire career because you're fucking LeBron James and you have some influence on that. But it's crazy to say that the plus minus number is what's capturing that. That's not what's capturing that at all. It's, I mean, the things that make LeBron the the amazing player he is are easily captured in the in in the box score, and they are true for one game or one quarter or one possession. Variants aside, those things are still true. I can say, I can look at one possession of basketball and say, well, this team shot 100% and this team uh, created a turnover. And I could say, well, if all the possessions were like that, team A is going to win like 100% of the time, right? So by the way, I don't know how to... That's got nothing to do with variance in that sense, right? The variance is, okay, whether or not that team will shoot 100%. But you can have a a, a player come in, shoot five for five and grab five rebounds in five minutes and have a negative plus minus. And you can't honestly tell me that that plus minus number means more than those simple box score stats of how that player performed. There's no way you could pull that rabbit out of that ridiculous hat. You just can't do that. So uh, I'll get a slight end to the track I want to make on Charles Barkley. One slight, one more tangent from the tangent guy. This is why I'm the shooting. Oh no, we've got more to talk about Charles than just this one. Oh no, no, no. I'm saying I'll get us on to Charles, (laughs) but I've got one more tangent until we hit that Charles, which is to your point there, um, Paul Shirley, who we are hoping to record at the end of this week and we'll have him on a future show, which is awesome. That's amazing. You were excited yeah. about this. We emailed out and he's he said yes. So yeah, I, I'm putting, I guess, putting him know. on the spot. We're gonna let the, the thing out of the rabbit out of the hat just so he has to now. But anyway, so <laughs> Paul Shirley was uh was, you know, he guest starred on a television show where he was a basketball player. And on that show, we see Paul for one possession. In that possession, he gets a steal and then passes the ball to another guy and then gets the ball back for an alley oop. And I calculated his wins produced and was like, yeah, by the way, this Paul Shirley and this would be <laughs> if, if if this was his wins per 48, his team would win by 88 points a game in the show he's pulled out right after. So it's perfect. So on that note of like, yeah, we can calculate one possession and it gets silly. There's that. Yeah. But on to Charles Barkley so, with this yeah. analytics stuff. OK, my- yeah. So this is awesome because uh, Charles, uh, you know, talks about well, he says a couple of things. And one is that. Um, it was made up by people that can't play sports and wanted the girls, which I just love because, uh, I mean, the idea that that sports, that jocks are the only ones that can get girls. I love that shit. Like, Charles, I'm sure tons of women have slept with you because you're good at basketball and you make lots of money. But I hate to break it to you. There's a lot of guys playing guitar in bands that get tons of pussy. So it's not about you being a basketball player. <laughs> this isn't the only reason. Sports is not the only reason women sleep with guys. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to have to. Just live with that. I'm sure guys like Daryl Morey got plenty of tail, too, just because they were smart and they had some money. I mean, let's be honest here, Chuck. They don't just all sleep with you because you're a basketball player. So let's get rid of that myth. And then and then he talks about how analytics is stupid, but then he goes on to quote things that analytics cares about. Uh, and, a, and in a follow-up interview um, with the uh, – help me out, voice of God – Brian, do some Googling. During All-Star Week, uh, he was interviewed with, I think, is Jason, Jason, something. I forget the guy's name. Uh, but in the interview, he talks about how Maury's not very good at analytics because all, all he does is go get good players. He's like, well, you know, Daryl Maury signed James Harden. That's just, that's, how's that analytics? You're just going out and get a good player. He signed Dwight Howard. That's not analytics. You're just going out to get players. You signed Trevor Eliza. That's not analytics. You're just going out to good, get a good player. And first of all, I'm like, what? Chuck, what the hell are you talking about? Trevor Eliza is on like nobody's radar as a superstar. So clearly. And Washington I mean, let him go. Like, how did Washington yeah. let him out? Yeah, that was ridiculous. <laughs> and then, and, and so, this, so the whole premise is ridiculous. But then let's. So let's talk about how Charles wants to have it both ways. In 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 universe A, uh, only people who played NBA basketball know what makes winning NBA basketball. Because if you didn't play NBA basketball, then you're just some moron who uses analytics and doesn't really know how to win at basketball, and you can't get the girls. Uh, in universe B, though, going out and getting good players is like supremely easy, and any moron could do it. 
And I'm like, Charles, fucking pick one. Either it's really easy to assemble a good team and I just go out and get good players, in which case I have to say, why can't I do it? How come I'm not in the club and you're in the club? I mean, it's, why does you playing NBA basketball give you an advantage if it's that fucking easy? Or it's in the other universe where it's really hard to identify good players and go get good players, in which case you got to say, well, Daryl Morey must be doing something right because he's building a good team. And let's... Forget, like, and let's not worry about the fact that, oh, yeah, teams that he's constantly praising, like Oklahoma, they let guys like James Harden go. How come they're not idiots? How come they're not, like, how come we aren't saying, well, that's not very analytical of them to just let the good players go? Because that's essentially what Oklahoma did. And I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think of this, but I, I think when Oklahoma traded James Harden, I don't remember Charles Barkley lining up, you know, behind me to say, <laughs> hey, these guys are idiots for trading James Harden because he's going to be as good as Jordan, right? <laughs> because that's essentially what we're looking at here is James Harden is the best shooting guard in the NBA, which is something you and I talked about two years ago before that trade were making, were, was made. We were like, he's only like 22 years old. This guy has the potential to be the best shooting guard in the NBA, and you just traded him for a song and a prayer. Whereas most of the conventional people in the NBA were like, James Harden, he's a good player, but I don't know, will he really be that good if he's the focal point of an offense and all this other bullshit? And I didn't see Charles Barkley standing up to say, to tell all these analytics people that they were idiots and that, you know, that 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 James Harden was the shit. And it, that sort of, I don't know, this dismissal of analytics is funny, but the thing about Chuck is it's like, you know, you might call anyone this that uses analytics morons, but you haven't yet demonstrated any like sort of instinctual knowledge of what makes a good basketball player beyond your own ability to play basketball. So I have like several thoughts on this. One, I'll say that the Charles Barkley analytics, again, this totally falls in the WWE promo section. And one thing that I was going to say um, regarding like Palmer is right after Chuck said all that, I said, a bunch of people are going to pile on Chuck about how dumb he is about analytics. Then they're going to quote Anthony Davis's per. Then they're going to quote DeMarcus Cousins on off statistics. So to me, it yeah. drives they're gonna me. quote a bunch of statistics and mean jack yeah. shit. So in the analytics kind of community, I've noticed kind of club mentality. And, and um, I may or may not do this. So we, we've talked in the past like Quora as a site. And I just don't think it's a great venue for sports. But one thing I noticed happened there when I would write stuff basically is – People would just get on me and say, he's just one of those wages of wins people. And they just say crazy stuff. And what I would notice <laughs> is if, if I use the words wins produced in my answer or post, people would be like, you're just dogmatically listening to this. Dave Barry's not respected in the, you know, as important as this is the stats media or sports media community. Oh, I love how there's a sports media community that essentially consists of uh, three or four hundred people that manage to get in the good graces of ESPN. And they're the fucking community that determines yeah. who's respected and who's not. It's, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but, you know, I don't really think that's my yardstick. <laughs> Agreed. And then what would happen is if I pulled the words wins produced, like just erase it off the post and I would talk shooting efficiency and rebounds are good and, you know, being the right player in the position, right? This guy's a center, so here are the things he should be doing and here's why he's good. They'd be like, excellent post. Glad you're not just dogmatically sticking by wins produced. <laughs> And so the, the this analytics thing has totally become and seems like a team thing. So Charles Barkley, right? He's just recognizing, and he's like, there are two there are two clubs, right? Two soccer teams, two basketball teams. There's the analytics team over here, and there's the old school. I played in the NBA here, and so I'm just gonna say, boo your team, yay my team. And basically, that's about as complicated as it gets. And he know that he he realizes that, like that's when we talk, like. Kevin Durant, maybe not knowing what he's doing. Like I said, I agree with you there now after you talked me down from my, maybe Kevin Durant's being smart. But Charles Barkley realized, he's like, all I have to say is your team sucks and I'm going to get page views. And he seems to understand that that's what this seems yeah, like. No, I, Trey, it's, also, it's cheap heat, right? Isn't this just cheap heat for Charles Barkley? I think, I think he cheap. puts some thought into it. I don't know if it's cheap, but I do agree he's just trying to get heat. And it's in near the all-star I, period, I, I get I, it. I think that Charles Barkley genuinely does not like Daryl Morey. And I think it's pretty clear that Daryl Morey genuinely does not like Chuck. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree with you because I don't think Charles hates analytics as much as he says he hates analytics because I think that if you if you were to sit down and ask him like one basketball mind to another what things matter you know in terms of winning basketball games I I think that he would know a lot of the solid stuff like he'd know rebounding is important he'd know that shooting efficiency is important uh he you know he'd know that not turning the ball over is important now i think he'd still also believe in a bunch of crazy bullshit like clutch shooting and you know having a guy who can create shots and lots of other stupid things but i still think he genuinely would understand you know okay a guy who you know goes out and gets lots of rebounds and shoots efficiently efficiently even if he doesn't chuck up the the chat jack up the huge shot totals is a good guy who will help you win basketball games i think he understands lots of those concepts but i think that yeah i think that the plus minus thing is in the in the in the per thing are things that totally sort of turn off players because those analytics are are you know are are crazy and counterintuitive i mean there so there are tenets of 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 how we calculate wins that people might disagree with right you know people tend to disagree with our assessment that tyson chandler is a you know first team all nba type center because of his ability to shoot efficiently because they'll say well he doesn't shoot very often so that's not that impressive and our answer to this is always well we don't really fucking care how impressive it is uh, because yes it's really impressive that Kobe Bryant can shoot nearly you know 45 percent when he's shooting 30 shots a game that's really impressive because it's got to be really hard to shoot that well when you're shooting 30 shots a game except that impressiveness does not translate to wins so who cares um, I had a good I- metaphor for that too by the way because I've been thinking like par Think of it like a tennis match, right? Like you can win a tennis match if it goes the full five sets, goes to seven games and a tiebreaker every time. You get the win. Awesome. Good job. You got the win. Or you can just go like, you know what? I want to win in three straight sets, 6-0, 6-0, 6-0 each set. So Tyson Chandler, that's what he does on his scoring. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to go the distance. I can't go the distance. I can't I can't go what a uh, Okay, I'm going to call bullshit games. on your metaphor here because That is an awesome metaphor. You're full of no, it. Anyway, it's continue. not an awesome metaphor because the thing is if a guy is winning 6-0 6-0 6-0, he is clearly dominating his tennis opponent. Like if you think about it as a per possession and, thing. And you're saying 70% true shooting percentage just like Tyson Chandler was No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that the the metaphor is bad because a guy a guy who is winning it, you know, three sets to two sets all the time is clearly not as good as the guy who's winning 3-0. Like, there's not, it's not even close because the guy who's winning 3-0 is winning almost every game he's playing. He's dominating completely on every possession. Whereas the yeah, guy who's winning in the tiebreaker. Tyson Chandler. Tyson Chandler on his shots is shooting like 70%. And you can compare that to a guy who's like Kobe Bryant, right? Who's shooting like 55% and shooting much more. And you're saying, well, yeah, they both help. You know, both ty- basically what happens is Tyson Chandler earns like a 0.5 win for that. Kobe Bryant earns a 0.5 win for his. And, you know, then you take off against average and that gets the difference. I'm saying Tyson Chandler gets his very quickly. Other players can take longer to get it. They're still both, you know, they're still well, what both. I'm, I, uh, all right. The quickness metaphor is where you're breaking down because, okay. you know, the reason the reason the guy who wins three sets – uh, three three games or three sets, sorry, wins the match quicker is because he's winning all these games that the other player is losing. Am I making all sense? Right. All right. You got to go back to the I drawing board. I think you're right. Let's, let's get back on track. I thought it was a beautiful metaphor. We'll ask the commenters. It's, anyway. it's not a good metaphor because in tennis, you get to you get a point even when, when the other guy is serving if you win that point, right? Whereas in basketball, you have to take turns with the ball. So if I successfully defend my hoop... I don't get a point. I just get the ball back, right? So it might be an interesting metaphor if we played tennis where you could only score on your serve. Then it might be kind of an interesting metaphor. But I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not seeing it, man. I'll I, work I, on it. I'll go back to the drawing board. <laughs> All right. Um, so while we're talking about uh, the All Star Game, I feel like uh, I, I, this is a last minute adjustment. I'm calling an audible here. So this isn't in the script. Love so it. everybody might get freaked out about this, but if we're going to talk about what the fuck just happened. Uh, what the fuck just happened with Carmelo Anthony? Cause that was ridiculous. So 
so first of all, I love the whole thing about how he plays in the All Star game, even though he's injured, and he talks all the time about you know just got to reward those fans that voted me in, and I got to do it for the fans, and blah blah blah. And I'm like, you asshole, you're not doing it for the fans. You're doing it because you want to play in the All Star game because it's fun and it's a good time, and you get to be the center of attention and all this other shit. Uh, even though nobody really wants you to because you're injured and nobody wants to play with the injured guy. Um, and, and, I, and it, you know, it reminds me very much of when, whenever the leading scorer has like this interview where he says, you know, I hate that I have to carry the load with the scoring all the time and I wish someone oh, else would BS, step BS. up. And you're just like, oh, you're so full of shit. You love being the top scorer. Like nobody hates being the top fucking scorer. Nobody wants to score fewer points that's just such bullshit uh anyway it's the same thing with the all-star game he's like you know i gotta do it for the fans you know i really don't want to uh you know i kind of i'm hurt i'm banged up and i might shut it down after the all-star game i really don't want to do this but you know the fans voted me in so i gotta do it for them and i'm just like i, I the, my eyes are ruined so far back in my head that i'm staring out the back of my head and and he goes into the all-star game and he and he says I'm going to recruit for New York. I'm going to make other superstars want to play in New York. And what does he do? He shot 20 shots, making six of them in the all-star game where, I mean, like where, where players are literally leaving you open. He shoots six of 20 in the all-star game game like 30 minutes and he plays in the crucial stretch at the end while Kyle Carver is sitting there on the bench thinking, wow, I could fucking win this game if I could just get in here. And, and, Kyle Korver, I believe, went with seven that? for thirteen from three and got twenty-one points. I believe something like that. Yeah, and and and, and in the crunch phase, Carmelo Anthony's in there because he's the only Nick, and it's in Madison Square Garden. So he's in there, and I mean, I gotta think, how is this recruiting helping? Like, what? And it, it'd be different if he was in there and he was playing different because he's injured and he was trying to rack up. 20 assists cool but instead he just chucks the ball anytime anybody lets him and <laughs> it's like and i'm pretty sure he had surgery about 30 seconds after the whistle blew at the end so i mean how is that i mean do we think how would you compare this to kobe bryant in L where i mean my shit is that most nba superstars fuck no i'm not team i'm not playing with carmelo unless you like you know there's no amount of the money that I get to play with Carmelo. I like I don't I don't ever see somebody like Kevin Durant or LeBron James going, oh, I really want to play with me. like even the ones that are like good for I bet they're like damn no I'm not playing there. That's I, I know that neither of us have insider knowledge, but what would you your Yeah by the on way that? I, I I we're we're starting to get a little choppy so I hope I, I come through. But yeah I thought that was hilarious when Melo was like I'm gonna go out to the all star game and recruit and you know who went, who did a really, really good job of recruiting? Westbrook and Harden, who went out and dominated the game. And, you know, John Wall, who like got a ton of dimes. He didn't shoot that well, but he got a dimes. I'm absolutely sure he went up and, like, tapped Kevin Durant. and was like, you know, the media is on your case right now, but uh, I'm getting a ton of dimes, and your contract's up soon, and uh, you like D.C., <laughs> so, you know, you and I, we're on different sides of the bench right now, but we could be on the same bench in, this, in the same game in a few years, and it could be a lot of fun. And Melo, like you said... Um, you're stealing my shout out, but that's fine. So I was going to give a shout out to Mel because I didn't know where to pigeonhole this exact thing into for this <laughs> talk. So ESPN stats, um, which is an interesting Twitter account. It's, it's a Twitter account to follow. Um, they pointed out that in, I, I think the last several years, Carmelo Anthony has had two all-star games with 30 minutes plus and zero assists. The rest of the All-Stars in that time who've gotten at least 30 minutes in the All-Star game without an assist, zero. So Carmelo Anthony is the only player in recent time to get 30 minutes in the All-Star game and not get an assist. He's done it twice. Yeah. The rest of the NBA, this is including the Kobe Bryants, the Allen Iversons, they couldn't <laughs> even do it. So, I yeah, mean, I mean or, or forget that. Like, I mean, like Shaq and, or, or guys who normally are, their job is not to pass. Even they're like, you know. They're racking up an assist. They get one. And, I, I you know, and, and Camilo Anthony is just one of those weird things. Like, he, 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 he creates an enormous – like, he has these high scoring totals, and so everybody sort of thinks he's a star. But I feel like unless you're from New York – Nobody actually enjoys watching Carmelo play because it's kind of a boring style of play. You know, it's not, I mean, we're not, it's not like Vince Carter in his prime, you know, with all the dunks. It's not like Jordan is prime with the fancy, crazy moves. And, 
you know, it's not like Shaq shattering the backboard. It's just, I to me, Carmelo doesn't really do anything flashy or interesting as a player. I don't understand why people like watching him play. Uh, and I suspect that is the case this year. Like, he's getting voted in because he's got the massive point totals. But it's not. I don't feel like anybody was thinking, man, that All-Star game... Like, if he'd gone to surgery, I just don't feel like anybody would say, oh, I'm really going to miss Melo. I really wanted to see Melo play in that All-Star game. I don't think anybody says that. Or so, am I just out of touch with what the average fan wants? I may put a link. I may, like, put this back on the Box Score Geeks and then on our channel. So I did a a, a quick segment about why the, the uh, dunk contest was stupid a few years back. I basically pointed out YouTube, in my opinion, killed the, the dunk contest because – I can now go out and see amazing highlights that happened in the game, and I don't need to like watch a stage dunk anymore. And that stage dunk can't compete with seeing like, oh my god, did that just happen in the game? And so, to like Melo's point, for this week's show, when you were talking the the what the f just happened, I was actually cussed on the air. You tricked me this week, but <laughs> on what what the f just happened, um, you you sent along a possible clip we could have used this week, which was this alley oop. This I believe it was Steph Curry. This inbound alley oop from Golden State. And you oh, just with, you where walk. Marcus Cousins is just standing there watching. Yeah. Like yeah, and not even a not even in a like oh I got caught unawares way, but in a literally I've got my hands on my knees I'm just watching kind of way. Yeah. Like, it was like <laughs> but but that was amazing and like to that and I've seen Golden State play and I saw Golden State starting to play before they like you know just Steph Curry like I was watching him and I was like I like I said he's he's got one of the quickest releases ever and like he just doesn't seem right as a shooter. And yeah. so I was watching that, and I was like, Golden State is one of these teams where I'm like, I want to see this team. I want to see what they can do. Yeah. Like you said with Melo, I don't think that's the case. So when I, by the way, it's a comparison, like the, the YouTube thing. It's like think about who you want to watch clips of on YouTube. And I agree, Melo, of course you can find YouTube clips of Melo. You can find YouTube clips of Bargnani. <laughs> I'm not going to go out of my way to look for YouTube clips of Melo. I'm going to be looking for like yeah, it's what like can Golden if State he, do. If he scores 40. Like you know this. If you if I read a box score and Melo scored forty, I know like twenty of them are from eighteen footers that just went in. Right. And it's like it's kind of impressive that you did that in a game, but I don't really need to watch a clip highlight clip of that, you know, as opposed to, you know, uh or even just the way he shoots those shots and how he gets those shots off, it's not exciting to me, right? If you compare it to Clay Thompson's 37-point quarter, which was, like, crazy exciting to watch, even though it was a lot of jump shots, it was still, you know, the jump shots were, like, 8 million feet away from the basket, and they were, like, with barely any room to breathe because he'd already scored 20 in the quarter, so the defenders draped all over him. And it's just, I mean, it, it's, it's not highlight-worthy to me. Uh, you know, I feel like he gets voted in because... The voters, they look at who's the leading scorer in every category, and that's the guy who gets the votes. But a not really compelling watching. And I honestly don't think anybody outside of New York was really all that interested in watching him play. And 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 I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most of the fans at the All-Star game are not necessarily from New York because I think it's kind of like the Super Bowl where like the vast majority of people in the stands are going to be celebrities and 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 – and and uh and reporters and things although this year might have been an exception because of the saturday night live thing so it, it just i mean you know what? i'm just have to move on here this topic is, so i want to you're, introduce, you're preaching to the choir you're talking new segment here uh, okay what do we got and the new segment has now taken three quarters of our show <laughs> So, so I'd it. just like to point out you're the one who made me host because I move things along. <laughs> but you did. We, we've, been, we've, we've been moving through. And I mean, <laughs> one thing I'll notice on that when you talk like moving along is I don't think it's necessarily a problem to get into specific topics and stay there. It's just kind of like knowing what to do with that. Like, you know, I could imagine Magic Johnson. That's a comparison I'm going to keep making you. Norm Nixon, Magic Johnson is uh, – <laughs> except I'm not going to get traded to the Clippers uh, – is, you know – like if Magic Johnson just realized, hey, I can keep out. Why do you make yourself Tickery? Norm Dixon? Why don't you want to be like James Worthy or I don't? You Norm know, Nixon was way so Norm. The story, by the way, Norm Nixon was like a star player for the Lakers. Magic yeah. came along. Norm Nixon got relegated to shooting guard. Stayed at star level, but basically was unhappy that he lost, you know, control of the team. He wasn't the general anymore. 
bitched about it a bunch. Man, that's two cusses this show. Whatever. Bad influence, Patrick. Uh, oh, wait, you're going to count bitching as a cuss word here? I'm going to. What is this, like, ABC? It's <laughs> We're not even, you're not even at FFX level? All right, fine. But then, and he, you know, he ends up demanding a trade and gets traded to the Clippers. So it's like, you know, from, from my perspective there, it's like, that's the point. It's like, I can consider us both stars. That's fine. It's just recognizing if one person is better at handling the ball and passing, let that person handle the ball and pass. So that's just kind of my opinion there. But I don't mind like staying in a one segment area if we're moving around well. And I, I feel the show we've done it. Yeah, that's, well, that's so, what I'll give us. Okay, so I hope the fans are happy with this because we've now pretty much used the whole show for the for that segment. We're going to call that segment What the Fuck Just Happened. I don't know if it's going to make a comeback in every show. I don't know if we're going to introduce some more. Oh, and can we ask like, if you, you guys aren't the best at answering these, but I'm going to throw this out to the fans because you and I were talking this back and forth about other segments. Two I liked were basic, I called them basically we told you so and we're sorry we were wrong. Because we that's one thing you said about the the site is like we'll we'll rub in when we're right, but when we're wrong, we'll admit we're wrong. Those yeah, sound like two great totally. segments, but you didn't think those were exciting like names, and I agree. So if the fans had yeah, better need, names I for need, those I need a name. And yeah. I mean, yeah, it's and I don't want to swear too much because we can't have fucking every name of every segment, <laughs> especially because especially because you need to be able to to say it out loud occasionally. Otherwise, you're going to feel left out. I know. Okay, fair, fair. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, we'll throw that out to the fans. If you have good names for we're sorry we were wrong and we told you so as segments. Otherwise, we'll brainstorm. We'll think of some. But if you come up with really good ones, put them in the comments. Right. So, OK, let's move on. Uh, I want to dig out some. Uh, I, I kind of want to call this the mailbag, except I don't really explicitly have any mail from any particular person to go over here. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about what we talked about last week and the feedback we got from fans. And, and notably, uh, last week, uh, James no Dolan kind of took over this podcast the same way Chuck Barkley took over this podcast this week. Uh, we talked about James Dolan's uh, infamous infamous email to a fan, and we talked about how big of an idiot we think James Dolan is. And and we asked the fans, we said, okay, what's worse, Dan Gilbert, you know, sending out public letters in Comic Sans, making a fool of himself, or James Dolan sending an email to a fan with no grammar and making a fool of himself. And it was a surprising dead heat. I honestly thought James Dolan would get more shit because, um, you know, first of all, James Dolan had no reason to be so pissed off because all it was was a fan saying, hey, the Knicks suck. And all James Dolan had to do was sort of look at the record and say, yes, you're right, the Knicks suck. And the fan also saying, you know, the Knicks suck. And by the way, they have sucked for like pretty much since you took over. And a mere cursory look at the team's record since then would show that that fan is right even if you're pissed off at that fan's like ability to you know be diplomatic about it dan gilbert like you know it, it was petty and childish of him but at least he was actually he genuinely had a reason to be kind of pissed off because the best player on the planet just said no i don't want to play for your team anymore i'm going to going to south beach and he also did it in kind of a douchebaggy way on ESPN and everybody got pissed off at him. So I feel like Dan Gilbert had a reason to be pissed off and maybe not in the best frame of mind uh, to send out, you know, an open letter to the world. Uh, and, and also I feel like uh, whoever worked for Dan Gilbert and let him do that in Comic Sans probably should get fired. <laughs> but uh, I feel like the James Dolan thing was way worse. Like, I mean, because the James Dolan thing, so Gilbert's letter showed incredible lack of judgment. Dolan's letter showed incredible lack of judgment paired with an incredible lack of intelligence. And that's a really dangerous and terrible com combination for the NBA. The, you know, you people did not agree with me. It was pretty much a dead heat. Uh, I, I wonder if that would have been different before LeBron James won any titles, if Gilbert would have had maybe more sympathy uh, from from the fans because, you know, people liked LeBron James again. It's kind of hard to remember, but there was a time when nobody liked LeBron James. And nobody remember, remembers that anymore because titles kind of cure everything. But there was a time when people really did not like LeBron James. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you want to revisit that topic or if you have anything more well, to well, say. Well, I think you called this the mailbag second, so I'm assuming you're going to move into Art Rondeau's letter. 
And, Which wasn't to us, by the way, but we're yeah, going to put it in our mailbag but, anyway. But but yeah, <laughs> but what, what I'll say is, so after we did this, this I, I was a little mad at last week because we talked James Dolan, we talked Charles Barkley, and then like after the show goes, I, you know, I press publish and, you know, notes go out. And I'm done for the week. And then right after that, Charles Barkley yeah. and Randall's ice cream post to James Dolan. I was like, really? Like, you couldn't have done this a day ago. Um, so that happened. And, and what I'll say, Brian, did you lose Dre? I lost Dre. Yeah, I think we lost Dre. Why didn't you pick oh, it up, Patrick? Oh, He'll be Dre. back. He'll be back. Oh, the vagaries of the internet killing us again. We really need to get like a professional studio or something. So I think what Dre's talking about is, uh, you know, there was a, there's a great open letter uh, to the Knicks organization that James Dolan about how he, he used to coach Allen Houston in shooting, and he did a very good job of it. Uh, and then one day without explanation, um, Alan Houston did not show up to a training session and Alan Houston also sort of refused to pay him, I guess. And, oh, you're back. Dre's back. Yeah. Sorry uh, about so that. Actually, I'm going to let, I'm gonna let you take this over because I feel like you, you've been thinking about this a lot longer than I have because I'm not doing this story a good justice, but recap for us what Art was saying about so, Alan so Houston and the Knicks. Yeah, Art has insider info because basically Art was a shooting coach, came in to help Allen Houston. You know, I you know it's it's hard as an analytics guy, but it seemed to be the case that before uh, Art Rondeau came in, Allen Houston was having problems with the shooting. After Art Rondeau, Allen Houston seemed to do better, and then basically a combination of Allen Houston and the Knicks basically got Art kicked out of the Knicks organization, and basically his cred got ruined. And you know, okay. Art. So without so, denigrating anything Art wants to say, I am going to call small sample size bullshit on what Art was yeah, saying. Yeah, that's fair. But, but it's fair. His yeah. his greater points still stand. I just. So what, what I'll say is it's it's hard for him, right? Because he was hired to do this, and he said, and you know that's his livelihood. I tried to do this, and like I agree with you, small sample makes that hard. But he he was actually in the organization, could see kind of the you know the absurdity of how they behaved and this kind of stuff. Of I'm going to screw you out of basically one month's paycheck from a guy making ten million dollars. The Knicks going out of their way to basically smear this guy's name when you know they have no reason to. And so what he points out is a few things. He basically says Dolan has a huge control. He you know he's basically He's it's a shareholder company and Dolan has decided I'm going to be a big part of the Knicks. And he's done a lot of decisions that you could argue if you were like a shareholder are not justifiable. So like the big one he brings up is Jeremy Lin. He's like, you know, and I'm not going to give anybody when we talk sample size, et cetera. I'm not going to give anybody post hoc insider info. So people are saying they did much better with Jason Kidd and Prigioni. You're right. There was no way to know Jason Kidd was going to be available. There is no way to know that Pablo Prigioni was going to still be able to walk at his age. So and Art said the me. same thing too. Art said, you know, and please don't bring up the how Jeremy Lin has played since then as, you know, evidence because that's not what you were using to make your decision at the time. And at the time, it's very clear. So the, the Jeremy Lin situation, which he goes over, basically says James Dolan completely mucked that up because instead of even just giving him a decent offer, he said, we're going to give you the, the, you know, the qualifying offer, which is like a million dollars. And then Daryl Morey came in and offered him like the eight million a year. And then Daryl Morey said, by the way, surprise, if you haven't read the new CBA, poison pill, I can turn Jeremy Lin's eight million a year deal into basically 30 million in his third year for you, New York. Suck on that. And yeah, so and apparently, I, I don't understand the all the, the intricacies of the CBA, but apparently that was only possible because Jeremy Lin's qualifying offer was so low. If Jeremy Lin had gotten a bigger qualifying offer, I don't think that would have been possible. Well, if they'd actually given him a real offer, then Houston would have had to have worked within the confines of that. Because they only gave him the qualifying, and Jeremy Lin said no, he was a restricted free agent, and that meant Daryl Morey was allowed to basically offer him the max, uh, this is like the Gilbert Arenas provision, meaning I, he could offer him $8 million a year. Because Houston at the time was under the cap, Daryl Morey can make that $8 million a year, eight eight eight. Because New York is not, Daryl Morey can say, oh, but for you, we're actually going to make this like, you know, seven, eight, you know, 10. And that 10 is going to turn into 30 because of your salary cap. So so I don't, that, that gets very boring for fans talking salary cap intricacies. But basically, he said, you really mucked up Jeremy Lin. You've mucked up all of these other ways that you've acted to your fans. You have this vast amount of control and you're, you know, you're doing horrible things with it. And he has, like I said, he has insider information he worked with the Knicks to see like just how dysfunctional they are. 
And we appreciated that because basically we spent all of last show bashing Dolan. And the, the absurd thing to me, and this is Robert Currents is someone else who commented to me on Twitter, is like James Dolan, you know, he actually owns a piece of, of the Lakers and the Blazers. And so he actually makes money on not the, their not the ticket teams, revenue. but the arenas. The arenas. So he actually makes money on their revenue, you know, on their ticket sales. So like James Dolan to me is this absurd supervillain in the NBA, which has this weird combination of being like a bumbling buffoon who is remarkably dangerous and is never going to go away. There is no reason for James Dolan to go away because the NBA has basically said we're not going to do anything to any of this behavior. Yeah, the only way James Dolan is leaving is if he makes a spectacularly stupid decision and, and sells the franchise because clearly, I mean, it's a money-making machine, so why would he do that? Um, or if he makes a similarly spectacularly stupid decision and does something like Donald Sterling and says something crazy and racist. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to imagine James Dolan going away, which is, I mean... I, I feel for you, New York, because that's got to be a bitter pill to swallow. <laughs> I mean, there's, I guess there's hope for them that James Dolan will actually live up to his agreement to keep his nose out of the business as long as Phil Jackson's in charge. But, but it seems to me like even if, based on reading Art Rondo's open letter, which I hope we are linking to in the podcast, um, it seems to me like even if James Dolan you know, gives Phil Jackson complete freedom in terms of basketball operations. I do not believe that James Dolan will keep his fingers out of the pot in terms of just making that a toxic environment that nobody wants to be involved with, which is their big problem, right? Is that the New York Knicks organization is a toxic waste heap that the quality people in the NBA do not want to be involved with. Like clearly somebody who is just trying to break it into the NBA would love a job with the Knicks because that's awesome, right? I get to work for an NBA team. But established people who have reputations and who, you know, who already have a reputation for quality in the NBA and that can pick and choose jobs, they're not going to work for the New York Knicks because they have they they talk to people like Art Rondo who have interacted with the New York Knicks and they know that it's just this and morass I, I, I and dysfunctional feel- egotism. I even feel for Phil Jackson because you feel like he was sold. Like Dolan's like, I'm going to stay out of it. You're good. Uh, Phil Jackson goes there and like immediately I, he's I, I've got to buy that immediately after getting there. Phil Jackson was like, what was I getting into? Because like the first thing he did is he's like, I'm going to get Steve Kerr. I think I said the name right. I always mess him up. I think Steve Kerr here. He's going to help me out. We're going to do great. And Steve Kerr is like, no. And then Phil Jackson probably after that point was like, oh, my God, there's there is no juice here. I've got all the money in the world and I can't spend it, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I got to buy Yeah, that I mean, I, I think, yeah, I actually don't know why Phil Jackson, like, took I that think, job. I think it was and it might be because, because the Lakers messed around with him, and I think he wanted to hop into an organization. I think he wanted to take it over. I want, He wanted to be in control. He was going to show everybody yeah. how it was done, and I think basically even for the great Phil Jackson, the Knicks just, like, are an unsolvable. He was doing consulting with some other team before that, though, wasn't it? There was a team... I forget who it was. Maybe it was the Trailblazers. I'm trying to remember who it was, but he was doing consulting with some team, and then and there was speculation he might be taking over that team uh, before the New York thing came along. I can think of several million reasons why he went to the Knicks, actually. Yeah, but I feel like just about anyone would have been willing to give Phil Jackson that kind of money. I I, I think Except that the Lakers because the they would complete, rather just mess around with them. Right, the complete creative control is the thing that the Lakers would not give him, and maybe there are other franchises that also would didn't want to give him because that's, I mean, that's ultimately the reason he's there is because he has complete control over the entire franchise. And then, and there was, I I forget where it was, but I'm pretty sure there was speculation. He he was you know up for a job somewhere, but he's like, I'm only going to do this if you give me the complete control of the franchise, and it didn't happen. So. Um, I can't remember who that was though. Yeah. So I don't know why I brought it up. up I can't (laughs) find it. Yeah. So have you got anything else from the mailbag for us? Um, let's see. We, we hit the poll. We hit that. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I had anything else, but I think that's it. I'll stall for one second while I take a quick look at our original. We need to stall. We're at one hour and one minute right now. So. All right, so do you want to just go straight to shout outs? I do have one, so I have a new one, so I can swap that out. So, Yeah, why don't you go shout out your shout out? All right, so uh, the first one, like I said, is Robert Currents, who made the great comments to me about James Dolan being even more insidious than I had thought. 
amazing stuff. I love it when people bring that up to me too. Because when I bring out research and someone comes to me and it's like, oh, by the way, you know that story you thought was just crazy? I'm like, yeah, they're like, it's crazy. I'm like, thank you. Those are great Twitter people. Love it. The second shout out, I'm actually going to swap out Mellow because we we managed, you did the audible and I got to talk <laughs> Mellow there. That was, I was going to do that here, is the great Kevin Draper, who we have often said should just be a perpetual shout out. He has an amazing piece at Deadspin about basically, we're talking Dan Gilbert, about how Dan Gilbert managed to, you know, use his political clout to get Yahoo Sports to bury a story that just had a, a single line insulting Quicken Loans in it. And this was just, just a great story from Kevin Draper. When you want to talk just the sports media and kind of the weird stuff about it, it's not going to make you feel good, but I always enjoy Kevin Draper's look at those. So check out that piece. It's great. So those are my shout outs. Great. Um, I have a couple of shout outs. Uh, my first shout out is to, uh, I, I'm, you know, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. I'm sorry if I'm not, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's Kate Sang at uh, Canisupis who had a pretty great sort of fanboy reaction to Zach Levine winning the dunk contest. I know this is not your thing. You think this is stupid, Dre, but uh, I thought this dunk contest was actually kind of amazing. Or I didn't see it live because like you, I don't really care about these things, but there's, there's I've been, YouTube. but I've been, vi- yeah, there's YouTube and there's Vine. I have been vining it all day. And it is like, uh, Zach Levine may not be a very good basketball player, but holy cow, can he look good dunk basketball? And uh, the stupidest guys, did a great sort of rundown of that event and did a very good job of like sort of, you know, making you feel pumped up about it, even though it's a completely meaningless event. Um, and and my other shout out is to Stephen Curry uh, for winning the three point shooting contest and looking just ridiculous doing it. You and I have talked about this a lot. The thing that makes Curry so awesome is not how well he shoots the ball. It's how fast he shoots the ball so well. Uh, he just like needs almost no time to get that incredible release off. And I don't really like usually watching the three point shooting contest, but that contest was watching Stephen Curry shoot the ball was like, I, I think three point contest is perfect for a guy like Curry because it's like, his shooting stroke is so sweet to watch. And in the three point contest, you get to watch him do it like 30 times. So it's kind of like mesmerizing. So those are my shout outs. Kind of, I don't know, somewhat fanboyish, not very analytical in nature, but that's what happens in the all star weekend when there's no real basketball to talk about. So maybe Brian, next time I'll try to work. I know you had at least one, Brian. Oh, yeah, I got a few things. Um, I did enjoy that all star Saturday as well. I don't know, Patrick. No shout-outs to the uh, skills competition won by Patrick Beverly. No, that's okay. I didn't watch the actual None. game, though. None. My real shout-out... Oh, go ahead. such a snooze fest. Oh, my God. Who admitted that, that, that competition? I think someone might have gotten hurt in the celebrity game, but I just saw the headline. <laughs> anyway. But, no, my real oh, shout-out... Wait. I hope I'm not stealing yours. I go for it. Here. we got to give a shout-out to Moni Davis, who deserved mm. the MVP of that celebrity game. And the fact that they gave it to Kevin Hart makes me think that there's like a sham going on there. How did like did you see that spin move she did on Kevin Hart? That was sick. She's like 15 years old. <laughs> no, we got to check that out. Anyway, I feel sorry. the world is getting ready just based on my Twitter feed like Kevin Hart just something's going to happen in the near future and he's going to be like Paulie Shore. Just everybody's going to hate him cuz I feel like enough people in my feed are just like mad at him to start but he's really popular and i feel just like in the near future the entire internet's just gonna be like actually he, he's you. Very, very much a one-trick pony and i think that's gonna as you're saying he's gonna run for political office dre that's a <laughs> quick way to do it all right no but my real shout out though is uh jerry tarkanian the shark who passed away and um you know he fought the ncaa for years and years and years and at the time we're like who is this guy what is he doing but the way it is now, everything that's come out, um, yeah, you got to give him a lot of credit for standing up to the NCWA when very few people did, and um, he had a lot to lose and did because of it. That's a really good shout out, and I guess we'd be remiss in not mentioning Dean Smith. Oh, I'm sorry, Dean Smith as well. Yeah, I wrote this shout out before he died. Man, <laughs> uh, great, le- two legendary coaches. The thing about Dean Smith, and you know, now that I think about it, I wish we could go back in time and plan that into the show because mm. uh, I loved Dean Smith not because he was a great basketball coach because I'm not really a huge college basketball fan anyway, but uh, because he's a very outspoken political guy who uh, was not afraid to voice his beliefs. And he did so 
in a state where a lot of his personal political beliefs are not very particularly popular and are not the majority. And uh, and Jonathan Weiler wrote a good piece on ESPN about, again, ESPN Watch, sorry, again, which is like the best blog in the planet. Um, he wrote a good piece about how that, that was a, kind of a big blow for Carolina because uh, for a lot of the like, typical mainstream residents, it became hard for them to be very conservative when there was this guy who was clearly revered among everybody who was kind of voicing very liberal beliefs. And now without that voice there, that state is probably going to become a very conservative um, hellhole. Is that the right word? <laughs> uh, Chapel Hill, they'll be okay. I don't okay. want to voice too much about my political view, uh, viewpoints here, but I feel like anyone who reads or watches already knows what they are anyway. <laughs> and I'm showing the piece by uh, Ian O'Connor on ESPN about how Dean Smith fought for integration. So, yeah, yeah. boy, two legendary coaches. Um, just real quick on Barkley. Man, I love that heel turn. I, I agree with what he did. He That's made all the... Turn. Oh, well, okay, fine. Not a heel. No, no, Barkley he... goes back and forth between heel and, and, and baby face. What's the other? Baby face, sorry. <laughs> there we go. So, okay, we're like way over time, but next week we're going to be back with Paul Shirley. Uh, it's not going to be a live show because we got to work this into our schedule and Paul is a busy guy and we don't really have time to do a live show. But uh, next Monday we'll have the podcast airing with, uh, with Paul Shirley. Uh, we're going to talk to him about – what are we going to talk to Paul about? We don't really that, know yet. That, that's we're up kind to of you. Hoping- kind of hoping something really interesting happens between now and when we tape that show and we're going to talk about that uh i definitely have a couple of like sort of fanboy questions for paul uh but in terms of topics that might be relevant to what's going on in the nba and stuff we're going to kind of wait and see what's going on in the nba when we tape that show um and uh so we're gonna have that show next week and then this show you can find this show uh here on YouTube in the Nerd Numbers channel. You can also find this on Stitcher. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Yep, Stitcher, Stitcher and iTunes. Uh, and on iTunes. Um, and have I got anything else? Have I got any promos I've forgotten to The to only plug last here? thing is if, for what, if you found this show without the site, which would be remarkable, what would be cool, we're at the <laughs> box score geeks dot, we're at boxscoregeeks.com is where you can yeah. find even more great content. Okay. And having said all that, um, we hope all of you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you all with Paul Shirley next week.